Space junk, 500,000 pieces of debris now encircle our planet. How can we clean it up? And Cassini, the little spacecraft that could, will end its mission with a daring dive to its death on Saturn. I'm Dana Lewis, and this is Insight. Welcome to Insight. Dodging space junk has become a major priority for mission control at NASA, with hundreds of thousands of objects now spinning in orbit around the world. The debris is now a huge threat to satellites and spacecraft, and there is an urgent need to come up with effective plans for cleaning up the mess. But there are some plans this year to go fishing in space for space junk. October 4, 1957, white heat and rocket engines roar. This is the first launch of a satellite. Sputnik 1, put in space by the Soviets, burned up three months later. If only the rest had done the same. We have liftoff. Since then, one after another, by the dozens, then hundreds, almost too many kicks and goes off launch pads to count. And what goes up does not necessarily come back down. The problem is now that reality is we have to start dealing with this situation. Um, collisions have occurred, so satellites have been destroyed in space. If we don't take care of our space environment and make it sustainable, uh, we could end up with an environment where it's going to be real troublesome to actually launch things. It's estimated there are 1,071 satellites in orbit and thousands of bits and pieces around Earth. It's a floating garbage dump in space. Rocket engines, boosters, even paint flecks swirling around Earth at just under 45,000 kilometers per hour, each a lot faster than a speed of a bullet. The reality is, is that um, um, when a spacecraft is operational, the operator has a means or it's to, to know where that object is. Once the, the mission is finished then the, and the spacecraft is switched off, then we rely on this, this radar data, the optical data, and, and actually it's not as precise as, as we would like. Who cares? Well, anyone connected to space does. You and your phone, for instance, your car navigation system, your daily weather forecast relies on satellites too. And astronauts really care. The hit 2013 movie Gravity was based on a Russian missile strike on a broken satellite. The trail of space debris hits a space shuttle stranding them in space, a plot not so distant from reality. Last year, while on board the International Space Station, British astronaut Tim Peake photographed this chunk out of a window, likely caused by a paint fleck or minuscule metal fragment. He tweeted, glad the window is quadruple glazed. And the International Space Station regularly adjusts its orbit to dodge larger space junk, including old satellites. Thousands of kilos each, many of them bigger than a bus. So there you see it, uh, very smooth separation. Uh... This solar panel from the Hubble telescope shows it was regularly hit with debris. In February 2009, an Iridium satellite and a Cosmos satellite collided. They struck at speeds of 42,000 kilometers an hour, creating more debris in space, at least 2,000 more pieces of floating and dangerous space garbage. This small object uh, will be moving uh, from the port uh, side of the station. To the and three years later, it almost hit the space station, and the crew had to take precautions. The European Space Agency says of all the objects launched into space since 1961, only 7% of them are functioning satellites. And the problem is growing year on year in a mind-boggling myriad of floating disasters waiting to happen. There are 20,000 objects just over the size of a softball orbiting planet Earth. 500,000 more of them are about the size of a marble. And imagine there's no international law governing companies or countries on what they put in space and whether they bring it down or not. A few countries now, like the United Kingdom, France, and the United States, have rules which say anything that goes up should be brought back down within 25 years. There are now all sorts of plans to try and collect some of the debris and deorbit it. Jason Forshaw at the Surrey Space Center shows us cube satellites due to be launched later this year. 
Satellites of the future will have small chutes or sails to slow their orbits and allow them to burn up as they re-enter the atmosphere. As you can see, we've uh, developed this model here uh, to demonstrate what it does. And it has a sail inside. It's a large drag sail that expands in space. And it allows your, um, your vehicle, um, in this case it's a CubeSat, to actually come back down to Earth much quicker. Fishing for space debris has all sorts of parallel to casting about on Earth's oceans. Sails and nets too. One experiment is to deploy a net to capture a cube satellite and using a tether drag it back to Earth. A second experiment will involve a harpoon, spear fishing space trash, requiring precise targeting of debris. What we see around um, this week At the University of Southampton, they research scale and movement of space debris with growing alarm. This is of course Professor Hugh Lewis notes soon companies are set to launch mega constellations. That's hundreds of satellites at a time for communications. And while those companies have made environmental promises, will they really deliver? My feeling is that these companies are actually um, doing all the right kind of things. They're engaging with the, uh, the scientists and engineers who are very familiar with the space debris problem. They're looking at solutions that, that will prevent the increase of the space debris problem. Um, so that's all very, very positive. Um, from my perspective, I think the proof is always in the pudding. Um, we need to see that responsible uh, planning go actually into responsible operations. But increasingly, there are calls for firm international laws to force companies and governments to clean up what's been launched up into cluttered space around Earth. I'm joined here in the studio by space journalist and broadcaster Sarah Crudis. Hello, how are you doing? And buried deep in that CV is the fact that you're also an astrophysicist. <laughs> yes, it's I very am. impressive. In the you know, NASA just came out on Space Junk with their list of the biggest polluters. Here's the numbers: Russia has 6,500 pieces, U.S. is second at 6,017, China is third, and there are all sorts of warnings. You tell me if you think they're being overstated. That if we don't get a handle on Space Junk that space exploration could come to a standstill? I think it's unlikely to come to a standstill, but um, you notice how Russia and America are at the top of the list, and that's because they were the first pioneers, really, in terms of space exploration. And everywhere humans go, they like to leave junk, and space is no different. And you've got to remember, when we started exploring space, so, you know, over 50 years ago, it was during a Cold War. It was a competition. So people wouldn't think about space jump, but now the, the volume of satellites going to space has increased rapidly. You just have to have one collision between two objects and you create you know, tens of thousands of tiny, tiny bits of space uh, junk that can still do damage. And, now and doesn't go away. It just and doesn't continues go away. to swirl So around. now we've really come to a point where um, low Earth orbit is almost clogged up with junk and it poses a real threat, not only to satellites that we rely on uh, for everyday life back on Earth, but also you know, since the year 2000, so anyone who's under the age of 16 has not known a time when humans haven't lived and worked in space permanently on the International Space Station, those astronauts are at threat. There is a small risk. Sometimes the orbit of the International Space Station has to be adjusted for larger pieces of space. And job. regularly, that really surprised yeah. me, and they regularly move the orbit because of some of the large satellites, not only in the lower Earth, but, but in higher orbits as well. And pieces of junk, and, and you think when an astronaut goes out on a spacewalk, they've got some protection, like Kevlar coating on these space suits do, you know, the same thing bulletproof vests are made out of, which will protect from very, very tiny uh, pieces of space debris. But it is a real threat. We haven't seen any serious incidences yet, but it's something which needs to change. You know, we're, we're long past that Cold War race to space, and these things have been a problem, I mean, a recognizable problem for at least a decade. Why haven't there been more speedy efforts to try to come to terms with it? I think you could almost use the, the same argument with why aren't we doing more to combat changes in our climate as well. I think sometimes there's this naivety that it, that it won't happen, but it is going to happen. And certainly in terms of regulation, now um, new uh, satellites being launched into space either have to be moved up into what's known as a graveyard orbit when they come to the end of their life. So that's just an orbit where satellites go to die or they have to have enough fuel left on them so they can be deorbited, so they can burn back up in the Earth's atmosphere. They won't hit anyone on Earth or, or cause any damage, taking them away from actually clogging up near space. I mean, and these, some of these things are bigger than a bus. Yeah, these some are of these big, are. These are big, big But it's, it's the smaller ones you need to worry about as well. I mean, the damage a piece of, a piece of space junk half a meter could do is potentially catastrophic to humans living and working on the International Space Station. But the real uh, money maker, so to speak, is how do we clean it up? Because we've got this problem, but now we've got to look at, at ways to deal with it. Well, 
that's an interesting question. And I think um, the thing is with space, um, the law is kind of finding its own ways. So as I said, we're, we've only been exploring space for just over 50 years. Um, in terms of who owns space, who owns parts of the moon, for example, it, it's maritime law applies at the moment. There are treaties, certainly, which the US has um, signed, but that doesn't apply to the rest of the world. So at the moment, funding should really come from the people who are launching these satellites into space. But it is a global thing. You might see in the future, and this is just speculation, almost like a tax for orbiting um, people who have satellites. Or the orbiting. providers. Sir, I understand may, the launch providers yeah. may say to the companies, we're not, gonna, we're not taking your satellite up there well, unless you can show us you've got a clear plan to deorbit it within, say, 25 years. Well, that's all theory at the moment, but certainly um, most um, new satellites which are launched into orbit do have to have those regulations in place by now. So it certainly is changing, but we're now looking at new methods to clean up space, so to speak. Here's so a bit of history for you. 1978 when I was still a journalist in Canada. Yeah. The Soviet satellite with a nuclear reactor on board crashed. It, it spewed across the Canadian Arctic. The Canadian government then so, uh, sued, sued the Soviets, <laughs> um, I think the, the, for six million and they got three million Canadian in the end. Oh, really? So there have been claims in the past. There have been claims, but it's not so much something landing back on Earth, it's more the damage it could do in space. But what we're looking at now is techniques of how to you know, clean up space junk. And actually what's really good about this is the technology developed from cleaning up space junk could also be used to improve technology back on Earth. So you think we live in the modern world because of the technology and the inspiration which came from Apollo. Mm -hmm. So think of all the new inspiration which come from this new technology. So we're thinking solar cells which could almost um, like a garbage truck almost clean up junk in space. Um, there's a tether idea which would work like a harpoon to take down um, satellites. Which, in a net. Uh, yeah. Before we run out of time on this, on this topic, but I'm, I'm very surprised um, when you talk about these new constellations of satellites. People don't realize you're talking about Thousands. 1,200 satellites and more going up in one communications constellation, and that is proposed fairly soon. Yeah, but you've got to remember that these are tiny satellites, which is so the old school satellites, which used to go up were big, bus sized things, and now um, small sats, cube sats are more exciting. So you, Yes, you hear about these constellations where there might be 1,000, maybe even 2,000 satellites, but they're going to be you know, less than half a meter cube. So they're much, much smaller. So they're, proportion wise, we're still not clogging up space as much as you think, but it is a real problem. And it's something we're going to have to address if we want to explore further into space. All right, Sarah, stay with us and thank you for that. This is Insight coming up. Cassini's grand finale, the latest dramatic images from the spacecraft as it dives between Saturn and its rings.